Okay, folks, uh, so I'm leaving uh, Pasto now. It's pretty empty, it's just at first light. Heading to the border um, uh, to, to go towards Quito uh, in Ecuador. Quito, Quito. Uh, so going up pretty high now, over 10,000 feet, and uh, really good fun. Uh, this place was just buzzing yesterday, like people absolutely everywhere. Uh, well, I had a bit of a request to slow down some of the videos through the towns. I've just got so many videos to go through uh, for each each uh, each drive. I'm just uh, speeding them up just to save on editing time because it does take a long time to edit all these videos. I'm going to be doing, once I've finished all my day rides, which is about 90 something, I'm then going to be going on to all the reviews of all the products that I used and, uh, and uh, things that I did. Um, as I've said previously on just about every video, riding through towns is where the police are. Um, if you're going to get nabbed, it's going to be one of these places, so just always take your time. Um, and you've also got to know and, and really be aware of one ways because Google Maps and even the GPS on the Garmin's sometimes don't know what's a one-way street and what's not a one-way street. So you just got to always look at the signs. They're either written on the road with, with the arrows or up on the up, up on the right or left hand side, or we'll have two arrows going left and right. Um, usually they do. Sometimes they don't. You just got to sort of like look and have a look at where the cars are parked on the road and stuff like that, and and go from there. So uh, left at about six. I think it's about five, quarter past six in the morning right now, um, and I'm heading towards the border with uh, with. Uh, of the border of Colombia, Ecuador. And as I said in the El Salvador video, when I was crossing the El Salvador border, uh, when they swiped my passport, they made a little tear, maybe three millimeters long at the top left-hand side of my photo page on my passport. And, uh, and uh, at the next border, the very next border, um, the girl at the front desk asked one of the guys to inspect it. I explained to them what had happened and they, were, they ended up, but the fact that somebody inspected it got me worried. Because um, it's a fairly old passport now, it's probably about four or five years old and it's uh, like at the end of the trip I've got one page left, not even a page, about half a page left of space. So I'm going back to Australia to get my new passport. Um, however, it's it's just a pain, it, it's, it just became a pain in the backside and, uh, and, I, and it made, it just, when you get to borders, it's just one extra layer of worry you don't want to have to think about. And basically every border now, I thought about it. Um, uh, not so much in Argentina and Chile because they just didn't care. Um, I had all my other ID. I had uh, copies of all my of all my documents. So with with border crossings, uh, again, have color have I had color photo copies. You don't have to have color, but it's probably better for clarity. Um, have copies. I always had at least five, six, seven, eight, nine copies of every document. My passport, my driver's license, my um, registration, my title, and I'd even make copies of my import papers. Uh, just It's usually a one page or an import paper for your bike. Just to have a copy there, I'd always photograph it. And now if you're using Google Photos, you can actually scan documents with your Google with the Google Photos app, and it does an amazing job of scanning a document. So use that. And what happens with Google Photos if you set it to backup when you have Wi-Fi? Every photo on your phone, whether you import it from your GoPro, whatever or whatever device into your phone into folders, if you allow those folders to be synced, um, and you have originals, like have it set to originals, um, it will it will sync all of your all of your files. Um, so it will sync um, all of your photos up to Google, the Google Cloud Photo Infrastructure, and it's and I've said it before, it is the one, of, it's the best photo tool you can have um, for storing stuff. So just make sure you've got all your documents and copies and things like that. Um, I've got I'm not I'm, on Google Drive. I've also got all my documents, all my um, all my uh, manuals for everything, my bike manuals. Uh, everything stored on Google Drive, so I, I, I've got access to it. And then on my device, you can store stuff locally on your device. Yeah, I met this guy. This guy passed me. He was going straight to the border. Um, he passed me about probably about an hour and a half to the border where we are now. 
um, and I met him at the border again. I'm pretty sure he's from Turkey, but he had a really sweet uh, um, uh, tenier, uh, uh, a motorcycle, a beautiful, really, everything was just perfect on it. All the stickers placed beautifully. It looked really nice there. Yeah. Yeah, he's a really cool dude. We were just chatting about the border and I just told him that I'm going to stop somewhere for breakfast. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a beautiful bike. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the 10 year, uh, 10 year bikes. Uh, um, but his was the best of, I think I've ever seen. Um, the, um, the super 10 year, I think it's, a, a, I'm pretty sure it's a Yamaha. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful bike. Um, so I ended up stopping somewhere and having a bite to eat for breakfast. And then I met him at the border. He whizzed, whizzed a fair way ahead of me. I think he got about half an hour in front of me towards, towards the end, but it was all absolutely gorgeous riding, sensational riding for the day. Um, however, so basically I'm gonna, I'll talk, I'll talk about the border crossings now. So the border crossing, uh, from uh, as you as you're exiting Colombia, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the border crossing. Uh, you're going to go to the Colombian side, and there's two buildings. There's one big building and one smaller building. You'll see it as soon as you come down the hill to the left. Uh, you park your motorcycle between two both buildings. There'll be some money changers there, maybe some helpers. I did, it, once now by now you you, you realise you don't need helpers. Um, and so what, you, uh, what you'll what you do is you'll park your bike between the two, then you'll go to the front building, the, not the first building, the second building, the big building, immigration, you walk around, right around the building to the front of it, and there's a big gate at the front with the military, some military guys there, they'll check your passport, then you'll go in and uh, get your passport stamped out, they might ask you a few questions. Um, so on, on that, um, what, that took like 10, 10 minutes. Then once you've done that, you walk around to the first building uh, that, you, you, that you've just parked your bike in between the small building. And uh, um, as you're facing towards Columbia, it's on the doors on the right hand side, walk up the steps to the, the door, go in there. There was no, I was the only one in there. Took me 10 minutes to get out of Columbia. Absolutely perfect. Hand in your import paper. They asked if I wanted a copy. And if they do ask that, um, always say yes. The reason you do that is because you don't you don't know whether you need it, and I don't know why they ask. They should give you one if you need it, and not give you one if you don't. But sometimes they ask you, "Do you want a copy of this?" And it's always best to say yes because you don't want to get to the next border, and then they say, "Oh, where's the, the copy of your import permit?" Look at the mountains to the left here; absolutely spectacular. Um, great driving, um, absolutely fantastic. So. Um, so from here, where what I did was I, I went to, um, um, so then I had to go to the Ecuador border. And the thing about it is, as I was driving to the border and getting closer, I just, a lot of traffic, like this is Christmas Eve, or the day, the day before Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, day before Christmas Eve, can't remember. Um, and um, nice roads, look at the mountains, spectacular. Um, and I knew that there would be some, um, there would be more people than normal. I just didn't expect what I got. So what I got was 500, 400 people in a line, stretching all the way around the front of the building. So basically I was standing in that line. The line wasn't moving either, and that was really frustrating. Sometimes you'll have long lines, like I had a long line in Peru, on one of the Peru borders, but it moved so fast, like it was only half an hour from 100, 100 200 people in a line half an hour before you got to the front, so you don't care. But uh, what I realised at the at the um, what I realised at the at the Ecuador uh, border was was that th there was just one big massive line of people, and you know, I just thought, oh my god! And, and I saw the guy from Turkey in the line, and I said, oh, hey, how long have you been here? And he said. 30 minutes, I, I said to him, are you, are you moving? And he goes, no. And I said, oh, great. So, um, you know, the thing about it is I said in previous videos, in your head, you just got to say, it's going to take me three hours. Okay, I, I had such a dream run getting out of Columbia. I thought this is going to be fantastic. 
uh, and then I drive down the hill over a little bridge uh, and you get into Ecuador and then I just saw this line of people I'm thinking I hope it's some sort of special line for something I don't know um, but no I just had to go to the back of the line and basically it took me two two and a half hours to three hours I was in that line absolute friggin I was and so what happened was once I got near the front of the line there's a front door and there was a guy at the front door just some sort of lowly official that you know um, at the front door but I noticed that all these helpers were walking up to him and shaking his hand and I noticed money changing hands each time um, <clears throat> so when you see that you can't go up and give him money because he he doesn't trust you he trusts his helpers so the only way you can get to the front of the line is by using one of the helpers and paying the helper like $50 and like they know on a day like today they know they can make really good money so the helper would walk up shake hands and he'd pat him on the back and then they'd walk through and they'd show their passports and they'd walk through so I was just looking at this guy giving this guy daggers he never looked at me but um, and that happened probably so when I had there's about 20 people in the line I was about 20th in the line that's why I was taking that's why I thought it was taking so long because this guy was just making a fortune just people coming in and people going out really quickly you know and um, I think they're all in on the scam because when I find okay so firstly when I finally got to the front door the guy asked to look at my passport and he said sorry not valid and he wouldn't let me in like because of that little tiny tear and I said I've been waiting in the line for three hours he goes it's not valid there's a tear in the I said, that's not your decision, like that. I, did, I didn't say it like that. I, I was trying to be nice about it, but this guy's a dickhead. And so I um, so I ended up just going through, and he just looked around at me for a second, and then other people were asking him questions, and he just forgot about me. But um, anyway, I, I st but then what I noticed was there was only two people serving us, but there was another officer around the corner, so all the people that were going through the front door um, with the helpers were going to this other special desk where they were just getting processed there. So I imagine that the 6, 10 or whatever staff that are working that, that, that day, or how many, whatever, they're all in on it. And you know, they might pick up a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars in a day on busy days for running that scam. Um, but just frustrating and you know, really pissed me off. But anyway, um, so I didn't end up getting out so once I finished doing that, I had to go, as you face Ecuador, on the right-hand side of that main building at the front, where, where, you, where you park your bikes, there's a little office there for the import permit. That took 10 or 15 minutes, so I was out of there. But the video, I did a video with voice of me leaving, and I'm going to be doing separate blog posts for every single, just a refined blog post for every border crossing. And, um, and I was like just swearing my ass off as I left like about the scam that was going on, the arsehole at the front, uh, all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, you, you expect corruption and stuff like that. You sort of come to expect that. Uh, you know, I mean, I've travelled through Eastern Europe and corruption's rife there because basically the officials don't get paid anywhere near enough to live a decent life and they work out, hey, you know, it's all cash, no trail. The only way I'll get caught is if another official above us tries to do a, you know, shakedown of them. But then who knows, that person might be in on it as well. So, um, but it was just really frustrating. So basically the total border time was about three and a half hours for me. Um, and after getting through Colombia so quickly, I sort of was hoping for a little bit more. But anyway, it is what it is. I was I was more pissed off with the behaviour of the guy at the front door, which I mean, the money changing hand, the sleight of hand, shake hand, and then I mean, it was just so obvious. It wasn't even like I wasn't even looking really closely. I could have really, I mean, I was looking closely, but I could just see shake hand, cash, and all US dollar too. Um, shake hands and cash, and then like six people. So you'd be like fifth in line waiting to get in and all of a sudden six people would get in in front of you and you'd have to wait longer, you know. So that, I mean, the fact that they only had two people working that day was pathetic anyway. They had about ten booths and about two people working. So that was that was uh, 
that pretty that pissed me off as well. Um, so you know, just you just got to deal with it. And it was probably the one of the only border crossings I really lost my cool a little bit. I mean, and the thing is, as I left the building with my stamp, the immigration on the Ecuador side, I sort of accidentally bumped into the guy at the door and I said, oh, I'm sorry, like that, and just kept walking. He just looked at me like, what? I just said, oh, she's sorry, mate. Like, as, you know, as if I was really sorry. I'm a good actor. And, um, and uh, yeah, I kept going, but he was a dick and uh, I, I would have loved to have had an opportunity to, to uh, get him shaken down and, and, and fired, but I, I think there'd be too many in on it. Uh, it's, just, it's just one of those things that, you know, I've crossed so many borders now, like I've been to well over 100 countries and you do see it quite a bit, you know, but being a, being a guy who accepting bribes and also a complete and utter dick of a guy, um, yeah, just, just got under my skin a little bit, I suppose. Uh, and you just see it because the thing is, some people who just have a little bit of power, it just goes completely to their head, you know. And this guy did have the power and he was just uh, a dick about the whole thing. But, um, yeah, so not a good start to getting into a country, but that's the way it is. But this was a gorgeous drive to, to get to the border. It was, uh, as you can see, it's pretty spectacular mountains and views. You can't really see that well, but... Um, so when, so in Quito, I was going to be staying for three or four nights. I was going to, I, one of the guys who'd been riding in front of me, a guy named Chris, told me about uh, these Freedom Bike Tours uh, there, and they have like a whole workshop. So I was going to try and uh, convince them to take a look at my front wheel and see if I can get that fixed, because it was now starting to get worse. You know, it's about two, two PSI an hour, um, which is not... Bad, but I. But from my previous experience, I know that that's just going to get worse and worse, you know. Um, until what happened with the last one was, I was losing like 10 psi an hour, and that's just unsustainable uh, for riding. And uh, and you know my my pump, my compressor was just working overtime, and I was getting a little bit sick and tired of stopping every hour and uh, and uh, doing doing that. So, and I did. I just didn't want to. As I got into you know, I'm now in Ecuador and Peru is next. As I got more and more into bigger countries or more remote countries, I didn't want to have to have any big problems, you know. Aside from that, the rest of the bike was running smooth. The, um, the, uh, the one thing I will say is that <laughs> with all the riding that you do, is it, it's good to do a bit, to learn how to do oil change yourself. I know, some people don't do it and, and that's fine, but it, it's a good idea to do it. And and the thing, you, you can, if you do it out in the middle of nowhere, just get there, like I've got a little mat that I can just lay on. And uh, and then I just, you just basically take a can with you uh, and, and just empty it all out and then fill her up. Wait for the bike obviously to cool down and uh, just takes about an hour to do the whole process. And if you've got an oil filter as well, um, you should, you know, you should carry those spare parts. Like I, I, I had two oil, oil filters my whole trip, and that's not too bad. Plus the ones I put in when I had services, so it's probably four or five. But for older bikes, if they take the filters and stuff like that, then it's definitely worthwhile having those on your, on, on your person, so you can just change them whenever. Um, it is. A little bit of a process but if you work out like some of my ride days are only two or three hours and that's when I decide to do something do a little bit of maintenance on the bike you know chain lube uh, check the chain uh, tension and all that sort of stuff and if the chain need a bit of tending to I just say okay I'm gonna stop somewhere really pretty and do all that stuff and with the oil uh, dig it you, you know this is this is the border crossing there's there's more people in that line so that's that's where you walk in this is on the Ecuador side so just on the right side there, there's a, there's a front door, and this is where I'm swearing my frigging ass off at these border people. There's a whole, on the right hand side, you'll see a whole bunch of motorbikes. That was from a tour. Uh, they were just touring a couple of countries. Uh, they were from, um, they were all from uh, uh, Colombia, and they were, gonna, they were gonna do a tour of Ecuador and then back into Colombia again. Um, there's about 20 of them. 
but they were all locals. Um, yeah, so right now it's F this, F that, and uh, <laughs> just, uh, it's now like past midday, and you know, I got to the border, you know, before 9 a.m. or around 9 a.m., so I was pretty, uh, pretty annoyed, and right now I'm just bitching about that guy in the front, on the front, uh, on the front door. But, uh, so, okay, so once I got to uh, Ecuador, my next video is going to be on the Quinta, uh, I'm going to have a look it up, I'm sorry, I, I keep forgetting the, uh, the, the name of this thing, it's called the Quilatoa Loop, so it goes right up into the mountains, um, and the loop is that you basically go from Quito, and you do this loop around the volcano, uh, it takes a fair while, um, but you do a loop around the volcano, you visit the volcano, which is a pretty, pretty spectacular thing. Unfortunately, the day that I was there, it was overcast, but um, I still, it was still great, you know. Um, it wasn't completely overcast, it was just an overcast day, and I had a bit of rain getting there. Um, so, but, uh, but that's a really cool thing to see from, uh, from, um, from Quito. And Quito is a pretty spectacular city. Like there's just houses just wedged on the on the on the mountainsides and stuff like that. It's a pretty spectacular place. Um, yeah, it's got some nice areas around the city. I went riding up into the mountains and uh, getting some photos down into Quito, and it was super cool. You know, it was pretty cold um, compared to some of the other cities that I've been to, but it was fairly high up. You know, it's one of the higher um, capital cities in the world. Um, but uh, it was just a, a, a nice day's riding, you know, I'm sitting here on about 80 kilometres an hour, about 45 mile an hour, just taking my time. The one thing that happened was, is that the hotel that I booked, uh, the JW Marriott um, Hotel, was on the other side of town, about 10-15 minutes from the city centre, um, and it was in a great location, it was a great hotel, and there's lots of, it's a busy area. Um, the only issue was is that after all this day, and I'm just going to tell you how long this ride took me, but the total ride for the day was um, uh, nearly 10 hours for 350 kilometres. So that's, you can see how long I actually spent on the border. Um, <laughs> too long. And uh, it was just, that was just a really frustrating part of the day. And then, then it got compounded when I got into Quito and they closed off one of the highways, which basically meant I only had one other road for me to get from where I was to my, um, to my uh, hotel. And the road was up a steep mountain. It was a little tiny, like really just a one lane road. And there was cars going both ways. Um, there was a little bit more than a one way road, but it was so tight and there were just so many cars on it. And you know, when you're on a motorbike, a heavy motorbike, and having to stop halfway up hills and that, it's not a lot, a lot of fun, even though my bike's got hill hold control, which basically means that when I engage the brake uh, up a hill, uh, and then I engage the clutch in first or second, it will actually hold for about three or four seconds, hold me where I am, and then it will release. So it's a really cool feature to have on a motorbike. It, it, it honestly, I mean, if you if you're um, on a on a flat hill going up a hill, it's not so bad. But if you've got a bit of an angle, and you've got a because the only way you can do it is to have one foot on the on the uh, on the on the peg and, and braking. And more spectacular views here. Yeah, one foot on the peg and braking, and and then the clutch. You know, it's not that hard to do it that way, but it is more it, it is more of a worry rather than just but with this hill hole control you just don't even have to do that you have both feet on the ground holding it steady and just just give it a bit of gas and away you go so especially a couple of the dirt roads i was on where the, there was construction even on the dirt roads i had some little bypass roads and going up these ridiculously steep little hills that's fine for a four-wheel drive or a car maybe not so much a car in wet conditions but um it was pretty handy to have the hill hold, especially when a couple of times, like I had a truck that just stopped at the top of the hill, which meant I couldn't overtake it. I, I had to back down the, mount, the, the mountain or the hill and uh, wait for him to pass because there was, was not enough room. So here is some like these incredible views. As you can see from that, there's, I think I've got a wide screener 
here of the whole view. That's uh, my little, I love doing these little hero shots. Um, there's a widescreen. I do, I do the Black Adder style sometimes. So I don't know if you've ever seen a TV, a British TV series called Black Adder, where the prince is being trained on how to be uh, a hero, and he has to make sure his uh, his pelvis is pointed forward as much as possible with a hero stance. So I sort of make a bit of a play on that with a lot of them. Um, well, me, Chris, and I did that on uh, on the Death Death Road uh, uh, trip. Um, but yeah. Uh, Good road, Ecuador, good roads, a lot of road construction, just so much road construction going on in Ecuador. Uh, so obviously, financially wise, there seems like the country is moving ahead. But again, as soon as the country is like Ecuador, where it's moving ahead, they have all these laws and rules and, and they have lots of toll roads. Um, you'll find that on a motorbike, there's a lot of countries where, and a lot of areas where you don't have to pay tolls. But the more advanced countries, they they get money out of you. Uh, you just you can't help help it. And when you're doing a long trip, like I think the record for me was 15 tolls in one day. And you know they're all like a dollar each. But it, I mean, it, if you think about 15 dollars for one person, and then you think about the poorer people in that country, like seriously. And that was for motorbikes. Cars were more expensive, so cars were like twice, three times the price. And then other countries don't charge tolls for motorbikes, so you, they have a little area on the right side where the motorbikes can ride. Um, certain parts of Mexico were like that, and Baja, um, and you know Guatemala and countries like that. But you just got to be a little bit careful, especially if you've got your trip. So this is the, these are the roads going up into the mountains um, to get back into uh, to get into uh, Quito uh, to get to where my hotel was. Um, Sorry, I've got the I got the around the wrong way of the order there. But yeah, really cool riding day. You know, the last part of it was down into valleys, and then 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 I went up again, and then into Quito, which just sort of opens up into this mass massive metropolis uh, uh, of of buildings just everywhere. Pretty cool sort of place, Peter. As, as you ride down into the city, you think, oh, "Wow, this this is amazing." You know. Oh, thanks, buddy. I've got to say, like, um, that truck sort of pulled out in front of me, but for the most part, truck drivers were really good. Um, the only ones that, the only people, the only things I had ever had issues with bus drivers, they were just, in some of the countries, they were just insane. So this is me trying to find how to, how that I get to, because it doesn't show you one way roads into Quito. Uh, so that road was closed and it didn't show me how to get from there to to where I wanted to get to. It showed you the road to go on, but then a couple of the road lanes that I went up were one way and then I just had to go back again and basically had to try and work it out by sight or following other cars, um, which was a little bit painful. But the video is coming up now of, uh, of the roads I had to get into to get into uh, Quito. So once I actually got into the Freedom Bike Tour, so this is a road, it's like a one-way type thing, and um, but cars were going the other way. And I'm just trying to, I've got to get from one part of the city to another part of the city down these side roads. And there's other cars and all that uh, going, uh, doing the same roads, but you can see by those signs that tells you the directions each road goes in. But because all these roads were closed, it really made it really tough. And I've got no idea where I am right now. I'm, I, I, was, I was supposed to be heading in the other direction, but I was hoping this was gonna sweep around. But as you can see, I don't have much choice. There's quite a few monasteries up here on the hill as well. You'll find that you know, all these countries are predominantly Catholic, uh, so there's a lot of beautiful churches and stuff like that if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and I, I am architecturally, I'm into it. Um, I'm not spiritual in any way for that sort of stuff. But um, some of them are absolutely spectacularly beautiful and a lot of really great history. Again, now I'm trying to work out, okay, I have to just go up here. This feels like I'm heading in the right direction. But this just feels wrong, doesn't it? I'm still maybe 10 miles from where I've got to get to, 
and it just feels wrong that I'm supposed to be getting to a major part of the city, a major hotel, and I'm going down these sort of roads. But they, I had to do a detour, and which after you know eight or nine hours of riding, not the most fun thing to do. You can see that one of the monasteries up there on the left, pretty amazing. As you can hear, the bikes purring along nicely. With all the speed humps, I just get my ass out of the seat just a little bit, just to take off any, you know, so for your lower back, because your lower back does take a beating on long roads, on long, long trips. So where I've got to be is all the way over the other side of the Mechnik Mountain. And I've got no idea how I'm going to get there. But it's interesting riding through these places. I love riding through these old little towns. The monastery there on the left. So I use I use keto as a base for two or three days. I'm pretty sure I went that way before. Yeah, the dog chasing after you. See, this is where you can't do much about it except maybe stop if you get a dog bite in your heels, just to stop dead. Look behind you, see if there's any cars behind you, and then stop dead, and the dog will just stop and look at you. Really pretty little old, old city though. So again, when I get back to the hotel, the first thing I'm going to do is unpack my bag, my, my bike, check in, park the bike securely, um, uh, check in. If you're staying in a hostel, ask, ask if you can have your bike inside the hostel walls. Um, always ask. So you can see I'll go around wide here because I don't want to stop accelerating. Oh, I do. I'm stopping to see where I am, so sorry. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll park the bike, get all my gear off, get the gear into the room, check in, get my gear into the room, and then what I'll do is I'll get my devices all charged up. I think I'm still trying to look at where the friggin' hell I am. I've got no idea where I am. It just doesn't feel right, you know. I'm, you know, the, the hotel isn't on the mountain, and I'm, uh, I've got to get across and down this, uh, this across this valley and down again. Yeah, so I check in, I, I, I've got all my, I put all my gear in, um, I take my socks off, put my socks, um, I, I get my, all my devices charged up first, and then I get my socks off, put it in the sink of the bathroom with some soap suds, and then I, um, and then I, uh, I'm going to stop here again, I, I've got to, I've got to work out where the hell I am. <laughs> this is pretty, I mean, it's it's pretty funny, but it's pretty frustrating like when you've had nine hours of riding and you're trying to work out how to get to the place you want to get to. So you can see, you can see it's telling me to loop around here, loop around there. <laughs> So I get all my stuff charged up. I uh, I wash my socks. Um, as I'm staying a few nights, I don't wash if I'm only staying one night. I 
I don't want any wet gear in my bags. And then, um, geez, it feels like I've been up this road before. Um, and then I um, then I have a shower. So I've got it. Everything's getting charged up. I have a shower. Then I go for a walk. Maybe have a bite to eat somewhere. Still no idea where I am. I'm pretty sure. That's a motorbike, a Freedom Bike Rentals, where I ended up taking my bike to get uh, to get the front tyre fixed, and they finally fixed it once and for all. I didn't do anything with them. They gave me a few maps for going to the Pinot Tour Loop. Great people, though. Pop in there. All right, thanks, guys. Talk soon. Questions and comments below.